In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live for the last few people to come in, why don't you grab your phones and jump onto Slido and tell me something about what is great about Jesus. Anything that comes to mind is fine. Just throw it on there. It's completely anonymous, so I won't know who it is.
And if you're on families on the floor this morning, maybe try and pick something up from there. That'd be nice. If you're joining us on the YouTube, you can do this as well. The slider number, I think, is on the live stream. Uh, tell us something that is great about Jesus. And if you're an impact, you should be well up for doing this. Brilliant. I'm getting loads of updates on my iPad here. Thanks, guys. Any more for any more? Oh, I'm spotting some Isaiah 42 things coming through. Well done, families on the floor, people. So let me read out a few things uh, that people have said. If it's too close to Isaiah 42, I might not read it out just now because I'll let Steve deliver that later, if that's okay. So I'm not just ignoring what you've said. But let's pull out some of the things. So people are um, saying Jesus is great uh, because he was a creation. Uh, He is holy God, yet saviour and friend. Uh, Because he did miracles. Because he is humble. Uh, Someone was remembering the Heidelberg Catechism because he is our only hope in life and death. His determination in searching for us and forgiving us. Wonderful miracles again that show his power. Incomparable. We should have ineffable and then we'd be done. His peace, his patience, his love for us, the fact he is the Messiah, the promised one, that he saves, that he forgives. These are all great things about Jesus, aren't they? Let me show you a couple of great things about Jesus I thought of. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. That is great, yeah? He is glorious in eternal majesty and power. That's a simple thing, and yet a mind-blowing thing. Jesus is God glorious in might and power. But then we've got John 1.14 as well. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is close. Glorious in grace and truth. Those are two great things about Jesus this morning. He is God glorious in majesty and power he is close glorious in grace and truth so as we settle our hearts let's pray together our lord god almighty you are eternally eternally powerful and mighty you are steadfast in loving kindness and faithfulness You keep your promises to save your people and to bring us to you. We thank you, our Lord, our Father, that you have sent your only Son, God from God, to live with us as one of us. Thank you, Lord, that as we see Jesus Christ, God in flesh, we see the glory of God, full of grace and truth. Father, we are tired this morning. Please lift our weary heads that we might behold the glory of Jesus. Father, we are unsure of so much this morning. Please show us the glory of Jesus, full of grace and truth. Father, give us what we need this morning. Give us it this morning and every day, a clear view of Jesus. For our good and your glory. Amen. Well, just as an opportunity for us to remember some good things about Jesus, we're going to stand up and we're going to read out the first verse of In Christ Alone together, given we can't sing it, and then we'll sit down and the band will sing it through for us. So why don't you stand up, get the blood flowing on a cold Sunday morning.
And this is what is great about Jesus. Let's say it together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ we stand. So sit down and the band will play that through for us. wonderful words, aren't they? Sin's curse has lost its power. And yet we're going to come and have a time of confession now, because although the the curse of sin is gone, if we're trusting in Jesus, yet it still seems to fight in our hearts, doesn't it? And we need to keep short accounts with God. So let's pray and confess our sin now. Oh, Father, thank you that, that for the greatness of who you are and just for all that you have done, Thank you that you are the glorious God of grace and truth. Father, as we confess our sin before you now, 
Lord, I ask for the strength to be truthful. Help us not to hide our faults or distrust the extent of your forgiveness. Show us, Lord, how stupid it is when we try to do this. You are full of truth. You know it all already. But thank you too, Father, that you are also full of grace. So, Lord, as we acknowledge who we really are, what we have really done, thank you that we cannot come up against the limit of your grace. So every one of us, just in a moment, why don't we call to mind our real sin before the Lord? We can be specific because, well, not, not that he doesn't already know it, but because he does already know it, and we can have freedom and forgiveness. So take a moment. Father, thank you that we can bring our sin before you, that you are full of grace and truth. Thank you for full forgiveness in Jesus. Amen. Let me read to you Psalm 103. This is what our forgiving Father is like. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. That is good news this morning. Well, I'm stealing an application point from Steve now because one of the things we learn in Isaiah 42 is that with the joy of salvation in our hearts, we sing new songs to God. And we're going to do exactly that now, or at least the band are for us. So we're going to learn a new song, Show Us Christ, um, and they're going to play it through for us now. God 
going to read from Isaiah 42 uh, verse 1 to 17. So Isaiah 42. Behold my servant who I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirits to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. 
Now I will cry out like a woman in labour, I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Great, thanks so much Gemma for reading for us and Tommy for leading. Um, Warm welcome to you this morning. It's good to see you both here in the building and if you're uh, following along online, welcome to you as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed that song that Sophie sang uh, for us. It's a brilliant prayer, isn't it, as we come to listen to God's word um, taught to us. So let me just echo some of the words that we've sung and pray for us now as we come to look at that passage together. Heavenly Father, we we want to pray that you would meet us in the preaching of your word, that you would speak to us. Uh, We want to pray, Lord, knowing I know my own weakness and my own sin, pray please that by your spirit you would use me, despite my weakness, to speak your words, that all of us together might be fed from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to spin this thing around here so that I can... See what's happening. So I don't know whether you saw it, in a, in a moment of light relief in a week of otherwise um, difficult news again, um, the New Zealand Tourist Board issued a new advert, and I thought I'd show it to you as we start this morning. So I haven't actually tested this, but um, have you? Yes, brilliant, thanks Tommy. So let's see if it works. <laughs> I've been alluded to a situation. It's been hitting me a lot lately. People have been seeing those photos on social media and are going to great lengths to copy them. I mean, you know them. Hot tub back shot. Man sits quietly on the rock contemplating. Hot dog legs. And the classic one in these parts, the summit spread eagle. Okay, easy does it, slip. Lower those arms nice and slow. That's it, mate. Oscar Charlie, the eagle has landed. Copy that. Hi, guys. I've seen all this before. Yeah, we all have. But this summer, we're clamping down on anyone travelling under the social influence. Okay? Come on, guys. You've had your fun. Trust me, you're going to absolutely love it. Okay, how about you two? You can consider this a warning, guys. Um, Enjoy the wineries on those bikes. And don't forget to share something new, okay? We have a suspect travelling under the social influence of the lavender field. Copy that. (sighs) What's with lavender? It's the fourth one we've had this week. Come on, guys. All right. Is there your foot, officer? Is there your foot? Please! Oh, man! Oh, man! Oh, Lavender! We've missed them! The door. Switch it off. Well, I just had a confirmation that the Lavender Loiterers just shared one of the most replicated scenes in all of social media. The um, follow me, fedora combination. It's just really hard sometimes, you know? Because there are so many great other photos to take besides your usual gram shots, do you know? What you need to do is you need to think outside the square or triangle. Come in, SOS, we have a hot dog legs in progress at Mustard Point. Over. Roger. I remember, I'm still here watching it. But anyway, there you go. I hope that was fun for you. Um, it's a funny advert, isn't it? But the, the point is that the New Zealand authorities are really fed up with everybody just taking exactly the same photo and seeing the same thing. It seems as if 
in a sort of bizarre sheep-like manner. We all just do the same thing as one another and take the same picture as one another. And they want people to see afresh the beauty of the New Zealand countryside, which sadly, because we're not allowed to travel there, we can't, but you know, we can get the idea from the video. Now, I start there because Isaiah 42 has a similar agenda to the New Zealand tourist board. Uh, not because he wants us to take a fresh view at the New Zealand countryside, but because Isaiah wants us to take a fresh look at the person of Jesus. He, like these guys, is fed up with the kind of pat answers, the sort of assumed Jesus, the Jesus of you know, commonly held views or RE lessons or paintings on the ceiling, you know, this kind of imaginary Jesus. And instead, he wants us to look at Jesus for who he really is, spoken of by God's words themselves. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I want us to see from Isaiah 42 what Jesus is really like, who he really is. And here I want to show you three things. One is that we have a picture of Jesus the other is that there's a message about Jesus, and finally, a song about Jesus. And so we're going to work our way uh, through those together, starting with a picture of Jesus. Now, if you look down at verse 1, Isaiah begins with the word, behold. And that's how you know that he's trying to get us to see a picture of who Jesus really is. And the behold there contrasts with all the beholds that we had in chapter 41, referring to the idols. So now we are, instead of looking at the idols in their weakness, we're now beholding the servant in his majesty. And who is the servant that gets mentioned in chapter 42, verse 1? Who is this servant? Well, he's clearly not the same as the servant of verse 19, which is the people of Jerusalem. This servant is someone altogether different and more brilliant than the people of Jerusalem. In Matthew 12, 18 to 21, Matthew quotes this passage and tells us, that it refers to Jesus himself. And back here in Isaiah 42, this is the first of four servant songs that Isaiah will uh, outline for us, pointing us forward to Christ. Now, what we want to see is that in stark contrast to the idols who will do nothing, you remember that from last week, we are, have repeated twice what this servant will do. It's there once at the end of verse 1, and again at the end of verse 3, what does he say? He will bring forth justice to the nations, bring forth justice. This servant will bring final justice to the world. Justice which according to the end of verse four will be according to the law of God, seen in God's law. Justice for the coastlands, that's for everyone in all places, all of the extent of the world have been waiting for justice to come. Now the reason that this servant is successful where the idols fail is because of who he is. So notice again, verse 1, who is he? He's the chosen of the Lord, the one in whom he is delighted. He's full of the Spirit of God who is poured on him by the Father in heaven. Now, of course, this is a mini preview of the baptism of the Lord Jesus. As Jesus comes up out of the water and the Spirit descends on him like a dove and the voice from heaven says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased all of which is pointed to here in this verse by Isaiah. But in some ways, the outstanding thing about the servant in these verses is not the justice that he brings, but the gentleness with which he brings it. Look at verses 2 and 3. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Now, maybe you know those words because you've maybe heard them before, but just think about how surprising they are. You know, we've had the beholding of the idols in all their weakness and nothingness, and now we're told to behold the powerful servant. He's going to come surely in a blaze of glory, clearing all in his way. But the picture is really different. There's no shouting in the streets. There's no breaking reeds or blowing out oil lamps. Now, the, the point is obvious, hopefully, that reeds, broken reeds and uh, faintly burning wicks are alike in their weakness. Uh, slightly differently, the bruised reeds are broken from the outside and faintly burning wicks have got no resources in themselves, inside themselves. But both are useless. A lamp that gives out no light or a reed that's no good for 
weaving or for measuring or making anything from. It's like a, a pen that's run out of ink or a smashed up out of date mobile phone as we were looking at in families on the floor. Both are just ready to be discarded and thrown away. Or so you would think, but not by the servant, we're told. He will not do that. And notice he won't do that not because he is weak. So verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged. There, the, the two words are echoed there, aren't they? Our weakness is echoed with his strength. He himself will not run out of internal resources, nor will he be broken by the things that are going on outside of him. Instead, he will faithfully do what he's been sent to do as he brings justice to the coastlands. Now, just pause with me. Let's try and bring some of these strands together for a moment. Isaiah imagines that by, by this time in reading his book, you will know that you are the bruised reed or the faintly burning wick, bent over from the pressures that are on us, collapsing under the weight of living in a broken world, doubled over with our own sin and with the sin of others, with a faintly burning wick, aren't we, completely out of internal resources to meet our deepest needs, unable to match what is required of us, unable to stand before the God who made us, incapable of digging any deeper in ourselves to find the resources that we so desperately need. Now, it might be this morning that you just don't feel like that. You might not like the image of a bruised reed or a smouldering wick. You know, it just might seem a bit patronising to you. I'm not like that. And stronger than that. And if that's how you feel this morning, I don't have anything else to say to you. Because the servant here is for those who are willing to admit that they are bruised reeds and smouldering wicks. Jesus used a different metaphor when in the Gospels. He said, I've come not for the healthy, but for the sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, he said, it's the sick who need a doctor. Now, his point wasn't that there were great swathes of humanity who were so well that they didn't need him. Rather, his point was that there were great swathes of humanity who were too proud to admit that they were sick. Which, of course, is the worst of all worlds. To think that you're strong when you're weak is a terrible kind of blindness. To think that you're full of resources when you're really empty is a dangerous place because the truth is we are bruised reeds and faintly smouldering wicks. I don't know whether you imagine me to be any different from that, but I know that I am that. I'd love to be able to do more. I long to be able to pray more. I wish I could lead better, preach better. I wish I could study harder. I wish my New Testament Greek wasn't so hopeless. I wish that I was the person who thought great thoughts, who could care and nurture for great numbers of people, but instead I bumble along in weakness constantly aware of my inadequacy. And then even in a kind of strange, perverse, sinful way, I'm able to turn all of that into a kind of weird self-pity. But I'm just a bruised reed, faintly burning wick. Maybe you feel something like that too. Maybe you're only too aware that you're not the person that you could be. You're not the Christian that people think you are. You're not the joyful, happy, positive person that you've led everyone to believe that you are. Perhaps you know that you're fearful and anxious, troubled and struggling. You know, finding it hard to come to terms with what's happened in the past, what people have done to you, what you're facing in the future. And if that's you, I've got lots to say to you this morning and it's really good news. Because this servant king, this Jesus, is not only unfainting where we're bent over. He's not only not discouraged and running out of resources where we run out of resources really quickly. But this Jesus also will not destroy us. He will not come shouting in the streets. He will not discard us as useless rubbish, but will stoop down to save us. A guy called Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, has written this about the Lord Jesus. He says, he, he says yes, Jesus is the fulfilment of the Old Testament hopes and longings. Yes, he's the one whose holiness causes even his friends to fall down in fear, aware of their sinfulness. Yes, he is a mighty teacher, one whose authority outstripped even that of the religious PhDs of the day. 
To diminish any of those is to step outside of vital historical orthodoxy. But the dominant note left ringing in our ears after reading the Gospels, the most vivid and arresting element of the portrait is the way the Holy Son of God moves towards, touches, heals, embraces and forgives those who least deserve it, yet truly desire it. Well, let me ask you this morning, is that you? Do you know your weakness, your sinfulness, your undeservingness? Well, behold your Saviour, Jesus, the gentle one. Secondly, a word about Jesus, verses 5 to 9. In this next section, it's no longer God the Father addressing his people about the servant, but rather him speaking directly to his servant's son. And if you scan through the verses, you'll notice that he confirms three things with him. One is that he will be a servant for all the earth. So, verse 5, God is the creator God of all the world. He's the one who gives people breath and spirit in all the earth. So, in sending his son to the coastlands in verse 4, the father is not sending the son beyond the scope of his influence. Instead, he is sending the son well within the limits of his earth, the place which belongs to him. Next, we find that the father will sustain the servant. He will take him by the hand and keep him in verse 6. He will uh, make him a, a covenant promise for the nations. He will open the eyes of the blind, the spiritually blind, release the captives, the spiritual captives. The darkness will be overcome with the light. Finally, then, in, in verses 8 and 9, the success of the servant is guaranteed because God is the God of the future. So not only will the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit not be eclipsed by anyone or anything else, but also God alone has the power to declare what will be and what will happen so that when he speaks, it happens, verse 9. Now, those are really broad brushstrokes, but let me try and show you what those three things mean. All the world is in the scope of his work. The Father will not let his Son down, and God alone is in charge of the future. Now, think about it. The God who stretched out the heavens of this world, that God, with all his power and glory and majesty, has a plan centering on this servant arriving, not to destroy the weak and the broken, but to save them through his gentleness. And this son, who in turn will not be let down by the father, who will be taken by the hand and led all the way. So think about it, that the baby born in the manger, threatened at his birth by Herod, yet rescued as Joseph hears in a dream that he should flee to Egypt, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, but undefeated by the devil, who he resists at every turn as he's then ministered to by the angels, obeying his Father even to the point of death, as he gives his life for our sin before being raised gloriously from the grave and ascending into heaven, with an unstoppable message which has turned the world upside down. All creation, a sure message, a certain plan. Now, think about that. And how does that contrast to your plans in 2020? You know, 2020 was the, the year that all our plans came crashing down. And 2021 is probably the first year for many of us that we've had the insight not to make any plans, or not to trust them at least. You know, holidays, projects, university places, business plans, work ideas, visits with family and friends, financial expectations, all of them came to nothing. Okay, so think about that, that's for us. But here, writing 700 years before the first Christmas, Isaiah tells us of a plan that God has to see his son preached in all the world, bringing light and salvation to the weak and the broken through his death on the cross. And we now sit here reading of that plan 2,700 years after Isaiah wrote it, and we say, wow, all of that's happened through wars and famines and earthquakes and pandemics, through the rise and falls of empires, this plan has stood firm. So much so that you and I, we sit in a church in Liverpool thousands of miles from where these events took place. And we have a staff member in our church who heard the same message in the wilderness of Mongolia from missionaries in 1990. You know, you and I think that the vaccination program's going rather well. This is going amazingly. Saving 
the broken and the weak from all corners of the world. Billions of people over thousands of years coming to faith in Christ, finding him to be a gentle saviour. Isn't that amazing? This isn't Instagram Jesus. This is glorious Jesus. Not Jesus, you know, one of the possible options in a range of world religions. This isn't Jesus who might have something to say to you in your moment of weakness. This is Jesus who stands at the very centre of world history. All that happens is centering on him. A plan that's been continuing unwaveringly and unstoppably in every corner of the world as he takes not the strong or the deserving, but the bruised and the broken and makes them his own. And Isaiah's point, simply in this bit, is just listen, guys, will you trust him? Will you? Will you trust him? Won't you see that amidst your weakness, this is the saviour that you need? That Christ alone is our hope and our confidence. A guy called uh, Richard Sibbs was a vicar in Cambridge in the 17th century. And in 1630, he wrote a book on this chapter of Isaiah that we're looking at. And he called it The Bruised Reed. And in it, he says this. Listen to this. Two things trouble the peace of Christians. Two things trouble the peace of Christians. What do you think might they be? One, their weakness hanging upon them. And two, the fear of holding out for time to come. A remedy against both is in these texts. For Christ is set out here as a mild saviour to weak ones. And for time to come, his powerful care and love are never interrupted until he bring forth judgment to victory. Are you troubled by those things? Your weakness and fear of being able to hold on for time to come. While Jesus is a mild saviour who will not let us go. Thirdly, finally, a song for Jesus, a song for Jesus, verses 10 to 17. In this uh, final section, we're told to sing, which we're not actually allowed to do, but we can do it when we get home. Um, A new song we're to sing, and it's new because it speaks of salvation for the nation. So I think it's new in the sense of everybody is singing. So the Coastlands are singing, Kedar is singing, Sela is singing. You can also add Ulaanbaatar, Jilan, Gostivar, Athens, Minsk, Virginia, Liverpool. All verse 12, giving glory to the Lord in the places that they live. And then Isaiah lifts his eyes beyond the first coming of the Lord Jesus to his final arrival in power and glory. An arrival that we're still waiting for. A time before which God has held his peace and has kept still, verse 14. But will come when the gentle saviour will show his strength against his enemies. So notice now that the one who would not cry out in the streets, verse 2, is now shouting in the streets, verse 13. Crying out like a mighty man to his foes. On that day the pregnant waiting of creation will be over, verse 15. And the blind of the nations will finally be led into the light of the glory of the Lord along straight paths to glory. Whilst those who continue to worship idols, who claim that they can see, who say to metal images, verse 17, you are our gods, well, they will be put to shame. Now, here as we finish, then, is another aspect to this portrait of the Lord Jesus. And it's Jesus, not just gentle Jesus, but it's Jesus, the powerful judge. Jesus Jesus defeating his enemies. And as we finish, I want us just to ask that question, how do those things go together? How can Jesus both be the gentle saviour and also the stern judge, which we find him to be at the end of the passage? How can you and I sing a song of Jesus' gentleness, but also of his judgment? How do those things fit together? Now, I'm sure you could say lots about this, but let me just say three quick things about it. Firstly, gentleness is not the same as softness, is it? I think we make this mistake often. We think that someone who is gentle is someone who we can push around. A gentle person often we find to be a timid person who can be bossed about. And maybe we quite like the idea of Jesus being gentle because that makes us think, well... He's going to do what I say, but not for a moment. Actually, the glory of Isaiah's picture 
is the two things that we normally would tear apart coming together in the person of the Lord Jesus. He is, in the language of the Bible, both the lion and the lamb, powerful and glorious, and yet gentle. So Jesus is bringing those things together. The second thing to see is that Jesus' gentleness is more precious because of his divine judgment. Jesus' gentleness is more precious because of his divine strength and justice. Think about it. If you're a condemned prisoner, whose gentleness matters most to you? It's not your fellow inmates, as nice as that might be. It's of little significance. What really matters to you is the gentleness of the judge. That's what counts. And that's it here. You see, Isaiah's understanding is not that you and I are basically good people who've just stumbled into a few wrong things accidentally, for which we should probably just be given the benefit of the doubt. Instead, Isaiah has been at pains to tell us that each and every one of us, despite massive and significant evidence to the contrary, have worshipped ourselves instead of God. Surrounding ourselves with idols that we can control, whose sole purpose, we believe, is to do what we ask them to do and to deliver to us the pleasure that we seek. You know, we don't stand before the God of the universe as morally neutral people who are unlucky not to quite work things out. No, says Isaiah, we're rebels, each and every one of us, to the last man and woman, boy and girl in the room and watching. So much so that if there's any justice in the world, the truth is we will all be in hell, away from God's blessing, under his right judgment. But then we read Isaiah 42, that the bringer of justice is gentle. That the one who carries the sword has arms open wide, willing to accept anyone who would acknowledge their guilt and come to him for mercy. That's amazing. So much so that the severity of God towards his enemies, among whom we would rightly be, just amplifies the undeserving kindness of Jesus. Think about it. The one who would rightly have condemned me to hell is gentle and gracious enough to save me and reach out to me. Isn't that incredible? Useless me, broken me, saved by the one whose judgment I deserve because in his gentleness he's opened his arms to any who would admit their weakness and their need of him. Thirdly, Jesus' justice is more precious because of his gentleness. This is the flip side, isn't it? Don't you see that on that final day, when creation's pregnant waiting, in the uh, words of verse 14, where they are, where his pregnant waiting is ended, and Jesus, the judge, finally arrives. Don't you see, on that day, no one will say anything in objection. No one will say, this isn't fair. No one will accuse him of being uncaring or distant because his hands have holes in them, marks of his gentleness, where he has hung on the cross for the salvation of all who would come to him. A salvation which for thousands of years in every corner of the world has been spoken of and declared. So Christian, this morning we can sing, well we can't, but we can, in our hearts of the judge of all the world is our gentle saviour. I don't need to fear the future. There's no accusation that can break me, no condemnation that I fear, for the one who would be my judge is my gentle Saviour. Let me finish with Sibs again, helping us ground this truth. He imagines a conversation between Satan and us. You know, we're trying to delight in the truths that we've just read and heard about, and Satan is trying to put us off. He says this, Satan will object, you're a great sinner. We may answer, Christ is a strong saviour. But he will object, you have no faith, no love. Oh, yes, a spark of faith, a spark of love. But Christ will not regard that. Yes, he will not quench the smoking flax. But this is so little and weak, it will come to nothing, it will vanish. No, Christ will 
cherish it until he's brought judgment to victory. Praise God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do not want to pretend that we are anything other than bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. Yet thank you that Christ cherishes us and in his gentleness the powerful judge who will come in great victory has saved us through his death on the cross. Help us, Lord, this week, we pray, to behold Jesus like that, our gentle Saviour, who loves us and gave himself for us. And in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to listen to uh, the next song, which is, I will glory in my Redeemer. Let's listen to this and reflect in our hearts on the Lord Jesus. Well, as we sit, shall we pray? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in this world you do not stay silent. We thank you that we worship and come this morning to a speaking God. We thank you, Father, for the ways you've spoken to us and the ways you speak to the whole world. We thank you for your creation which sings your majesty and wonder. We thank you for the ways you speak to us through our conscience, but supremely, as we've looked at this morning, we thank you for how you've spoken to us in your Son and by his word. We praise you that you have not left us alone.
but that you have come and drawn near. We thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you for how it's helped us to see Christ. We pray that you'd help us this week to fix our eyes upon him. And as we do so, to trust him, not to trust ourselves or uh, the circumstances or people or things around us. And we pray that it would help us to sing about him too, to be joyful, not in our own strength or our own skills, but in him. And we pray that as we do that, you might help us to be salt and light to our families and our friends, our neighbours and our colleagues, to strangers that we meet in the street or in the shops. We pray that you may help uh, us as we uh, sing about Christ um, to uh, spread that salt and that light to those around us that others might see our lives gripped by and lived praising Jesus and want to know more. We pray too for the other churches in our city. Uh, We pray that you might help them uh, to continue to preach the word in season and out of season. We pray too that they would be like lights on the hill, holding out hope and truth to this city, wherever they, they are. We pray in particular for Trinity Church in Everton. We pray that the community there may know that there is truly something different about that church, and we pray they might see that by their love, one for the other. We think about your world and we pray for efforts all around the world, not just in this city, to reach people with the good news of Jesus. And this morning I want to pray for the nation of China. We pray for your people, our brothers and sisters, often controlled, watched, persecuted in that nation. We thank you for those who are risking all in China to preach the gospel, to live as Christians, and to hold out the hope of uh, Jesus. And we pray for this city's, for Liverpool's, connections to China. And we pray for those people who are working here in this city to reach the Chinese, Chinese diaspora with the gospel. And we pray that as your gospel goes forth, the many seeds sown here would take root, would grow, and would develop much fruit, even on Zoom. To that end, we too, we pray for uh, um, those mission partners connected with this church around the world. And we think especially of the couple working in Athens, whose name escapes me, but Lord, you know them. And uh, we thank you for them attempting to reach, I think, mostly students in that city. And we pray for them as they battle with the frustrations of virtual meetings and uh, Bible studies on Zoom and the rest of it. And we pray that they, they would trust in you And we pray that they would trust in your spirit to be powerfully at work in the lives of those who come to the events they put on. That those who come would hear the word and uh, that it might take root in their life and bear fruit. We pray, Father, too, for our nation, where by turns people seem uh, supremely confident in human progress and at the same time fearful and anxious. And as we've acknowledged this morning, We find lots of that in our own hearts too. We thank you, Father, for those who trust trust in Christ can have supreme peace. And we thank you too that we need not have any fear of death, for we have a saviour who has trampled death and who promises to take us to a kingdom where there are no more tears or pain or mourning or crying. We pray that you may help us to have confidence and boldness to share that confidence that we have in Christ. Give wisdom, we pray, to our elected politicians and those who advise them as they make difficult decisions at this time. Finally, Father, we pray for this local church family. We pray that you'd help us to find ways to really be family to each other at the moment. And we lift up to you in particular uh, those in special need. Um, We think of Eliana Chesney, Um, with her operation this week. We pray for great skill for the doctors and nurses who will be treating her. We pray for a quick recovery. We pray for the peace of Christ to rule and reign in their hearts and in their family. And as we go out into this week, we pray that you'd help us to remember that you are a speaking God. May we listen to you above all the other voices calling on our attention this week and live to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
So as a, a church family of bruised reeds and sputtering wicks, uh, let's say together the Lord's Prayer and focus on who he is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So just as we leave, uh, what does it mean to live this week as bruised reeds and spluttering candles? Well, we have this God. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, and through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, before all time and now and forever. Amen. Great. Well, it is time for us to go our separate ways now. Um, I'll dismiss you from the front and from the back. Um, just a reminder, as always, please don't congregate um, outside the doors. We need to keep them clear uh, and you need to head off home. You're allowed to go home in ones with one other person if you've arranged that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, please do get home as quickly as you can. So, uh, do have a wave as well to the Zoomers or to Marco if that's easier. Um, front row, if you guys want to stand up and leave us now, thanks for coming. Great to see you guys. Uh, if those guys on the back row also want to stand up, you guys can leave out of the back door. Good to see you all. Okay, and the second row, this door's clear now if you guys want to head off out. See you next week, Lord willing. Thanks, Gemma. Okay, and if the next row want to go, uh, Bert Whistles and Brewers and Critchleys, Rogers, see you guys. Bye bye, Thurgers. See you, Ben. Oh. Schnauskis and Euro, if you guys want to go. Thanks for coming. See you, boys. Jonah, Matteo, Aidan, good to see you. Katrina. See you, Zavon. And last man standing, you guys can head off. Whichever way you like, both doors are free now. Judge